It's a long, dark walk under the streets of Nogales, Mexico. These drainage tunnels prevent seasonal rains from flooding the streets above. They also allow human and drug traffickers underground access from Mexico into the United States. It's not the kind of place you want to go for an afternoon stroll, not without a police escort and lots of guns. ¿Cuánto, desde este punto hasta el otro lado, cuánto tiempo es? ¿Cuánto distancia es? Pues yo creo que casi la, la pared es la línea. OK. So this is pretty amazing here. You got this, uh, so this is uh, the Comandante showing us this is a, another tunnel which has been f found and filled in with concrete. Now, actually, this line is almost the border into the United States. Like, right through here, is the United States. We're right up on the, on, on the border here, underground. So this, you know, make this tunnel from here and just take drugs into the United States. Have someone go down that side. Now this concrete, you can see, was like poured in by the Border Patrol. The BP there stands for Border Patrol. They recognize the Border Patrol found this. So they poured in concrete from the United States side, just poured it down, and it ended up, you know, filled up here. And they had to have some cooperation here from the Mexican authorities, I think, because apparently they put a piece of something here to block this concrete, but it came down to stop it. So there's coordination between the two, the two countries. Yon Grillo is a freelance journalist working for outlets including the New York Times and Time Magazine. He's not staff. Freelance means he proposes stories to media outlets and they either buy his work or not. Or an outlet contacts him to request his coverage on some issue or event. Grillo is one member of a new generation of freelance journalists increasingly filling the void left by mainstream media retreating from news coverage abroad. As corporate media close bureaus and cut staff around the world, it's freelancers who take their place. Okay, so this is a drainage tunnel from the United States that goes into Mexico. Now the issue is, is you have in this area one city which crosses the border. However, drug smugglers would use these to smuggle drugs into the United States. It smells pretty funky down here right now. <laughs> you can, uh, you start getting into this area, which is also used for sewage. Grillo has covered drug trafficking in Mexico for 15 years, but even he didn't fully understand the impact of this border on the lives of people living in its shadow. We'll follow him as he reveals those hidden stories on both sides of this frontier. Well, you can see a pretty long tunnel going right, which is like right to the United States. So you can see this is something else, and it's been, you can see kind of holes in there. You can see this is something else, which is, will be a way to potentially move drugs. Photojournalist Patrick Tombola is based in Venice, Italy. He's making photos which he'll try to sell to the New York Times. Like Grillo, Tombola is a dedicated, determined, and tech-savvy professional putting everything on the line to live life his way. His last job with Grillo was this story on El Salvador for Time magazine. You've got two layers of gates and you've got a lighted area and you've got obviously some various sensors and equipment here. Grillo and Tombola are here to bring us the information we need to make crucial decisions about our lives and the world we live in. It's important to understand who these journalists are and how they work, the places they take us and the people we meet. This is some kind of defense so you couldn't just drill up from here into the United States. The United States begins there. In this line here. Now, I'm in Mexico. This is the line separating the two countries. And now I can step back into the United States. Just like that. Increíble. Increíble.
Perdón, la marcha va para allá, ¿no? Sí. ¿No has visto a Gerardo Carrillo? No. Mexico is where I started my career, right out of graduate school. It was here that I began working as a freelance foreign correspondent 40 years ago. And I'm looking for Gerardo Carrillo, a friend and colleague from my days of covering Mexico and Central America for United Press International and Newsweek magazine. Like me, Carrillo started out as a freelancer. He later founded the video unit for the Associated Press in Mexico. Today, he's a critical link between freelancers like myself and stories on the ground. Carrillo can cover this march as a one-man band, or what I call a backpack journalist, because of technology. Instead of the larger, more expensive cameras he used to lug around in the 1980s, he now uses gear that is smaller, lighter, and cheaper. And he can do the job himself, without assistance. The people behind me, these journalists, this is the grassroots level of journalism in places like Mexico. And I would venture to say, in a lot of places around Latin America, you know, they're young, they're idealistic, they're hardworking, they're probably underpaid, underprotected, not well supported by their employers. I don't know how many are freelancers or, or, or full-timers. These are the kind of people that get out there. This is where the news, the information begins to flow from, from people who are doing stuff like this at the very, very bottom level of news and information gathering. It's not just technology that's changed here. So has Mexico. The country has mutated from a generally peaceful place to a violent, lethal place where el narco, or drug traffickers, are engaged in what some call an insurgency. Experts say at least 175,000 people have died in Mexico's decade-old drug war. Another 28,000 have disappeared. Caught in the jaws of this carnage are the journalists who cover it. Today, Mexico is one of the worst countries in the world to be a journalist. More than 100 journalists have been murdered here since the year 2000. 25 others have disappeared and are presumed dead. Of all the journalists killed in Mexico's drug war, none is a foreigner. All are Mexican. Perhaps the narcos understand that killing a foreign journalist might be bad for business. Whenever things get too hot for foreign journalists like me, we can run to the airport, whip out a foreign passport, and head home. But Mexican journalists can't do that. They already are home. On a laptop computer, Carrillo edits his video of this woman's rights march before transmitting the material to the Associated Press in Washington. This was unthinkable when I first came to this country in 1977. As I watch Carrillo toil away at his craft, I'm reminded how much freelancers like me depend on people like him. For the work they do at the grassroots level of journalism, for the guidance they provide about navigating their country and their people. This man's story is all too common in Mexico. About twice as many women died during childbirth in Mexico as in the United States. And the U.S. has the worst rate of maternal mortality in the developed world. The numbers for infant mortality in Mexico are just as bad. Janet Jarman wants to help change that by making a documentary film. I'm really interested in, in, in medicine and public health and ancient traditions about health. And 
I wanted to, to do a project that really showed how you could blend traditional culture and modern medicine today. And that's how I got really interested in midwives, mostly as a way to tell this story because the midwives are often right in the middle of this debate. Her film explores conflicting visions between midwives and medical professionals about how to provide a safe and dignified childbirth experience for women. I followed Jarman to the violent state of Guerrero, one of the locations where she's shooting her documentary. She's been working on the film for over a year. Like many other freelancers working on documentary projects, her film is funded by a major grant. So I put together a, a big proposal and thought about what is the complete story here and how could I really make a difference with this topic in the lives of women and families. Um, and I applied for the grant and they, and, and they gave it to me. And I, was, I remember sitting on my sofa reading that email that day thinking, wow, this is, this is really gonna happen. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just, I'm so grateful for this opportunity to be able to do a story in, in, with this much depth. On the road to Guerrero, I asked her what it takes to be a freelancer. I think if you're freelance, you need to have a really supportive home team or you know, personal life, people in your personal life who will support this lifestyle. I think it's most important. And then you make personal choices of, of how you want to live and you know what it, what you want to commit to in your life and what kind of compromises you want to make if Gerardo Carrillo is part of the technology revolution that's changing the tools of our craft Janet Jarman is part of the gender revolution that's changing the faces of our craft. She started out as a photographer for the Miami Herald, but left to take a master's degree, then became a freelancer. Like so many photojournalists enabled by technology, she began to work in video. Foreign correspondence once was a field dominated by white, middle, and upper-class men. That's no longer the case. Guerrero is long considered one of Mexico's most violent states. It's especially known for violence against women who often show up dead in the street or they just disappear. So working here, sometimes at night with an all-female team on a story about women really put me on edge. Jarman and her team have spent the night in this hospital where some women elect to give birth with a midwife, but with backup support of hospital staff in case of emergency. The birth was beautiful. It was very gentle. The pictures I have of the husband and wife and how she's holding him and you know, using him for support and holding hands. I mean, there were just so many touching moments. And what was fascinating was you know, why she she chose this because when they come to this hospital, the model is the women the woman can choose if she wants an institutional birth or if she wants to come to this section of the hospital. And this woman had had an institutional birth for her first child, and she said that she felt very lonely. And this time, she thought she could have her husband in the room with her, and that really meant a lot to her. And you could see it. Her current project may be about the specific issue of childbirth, but overall her work is about giving voice and face to the people of Mexico. Mostly I want people to have a connection with the subjects. I want them to walk away feeling like maybe they understand a person better or on a very deep human level, that people are not statistics, that they are real people with similar problems, same emotions, basically the same 
human experience. Despite the difficulties and the dangers of their craft, freelance foreign correspondents like Jarman are driven by a deep sense of purpose. If there's a single thread that binds or defines them all, it's the need to make a difference. Back in Nogales with Yon Grillo and his fixer, Milton Martinez, we explore the border fence with the United States. Things get a bit sketchy here, especially at night. I... Aquí hay muchos reporteros que hacen la nota roja aquí en Nogales. Sí, preferentemente hacen nota roja, ¿no? Sí. ¿Y, y si, hay, pues, si sigue mucho ejecutado aquí o en la ciudad? Sí, aquí en la ciudad nunca ha parado las ejecuciones. Es, es algo extraño. En la ciudad de, de Nogales, they have those lights over here. Okay. We pulled up to a place along the border where U.S. officials, that's the United States on the other side of this fence, have set up a powerful light. Milton says this area of the border is a hot zone for trafficking drugs and people. What are these lights for, Young? This is uh, lights from the US side of the border to show people, to, so, so you can see clearly if someone's crossing, if someone climbs over the fence or tries to drill a hole and run into the United States, then people can see it easily. You've got lights showing, so you can't, you can't hide under cover of darkness. In the point that you say before, this is the way the US government shows its power to you because it used to be a, a very quiet city. You remember, it used to be one city. They, we are, they, it was a brotherhood. Yon spots a group of men on our side of the border. They're watching us. They don't look friendly. We're careful okay. not to point the camera in their direction. So what we basically, we came across here and uh, there's a bunch of vehicles, three, two big trucks, one car, right behind where the camera is and uh, some guys looked like they were trying to check out getting over the fence. They looked like they might have some merchandise, meaning drugs, in the cars. And as we stopped here, one of the guys wandered past, checking us out, seeing who we are. Uh, so they're probably just, OK, see we're some, we can probably work, recognize we're journalists, yep. see we're talking into a camera. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, this, this varies in different parts of the border, how they're going to react to you. Um, in Nogales, it's more of a chilled area. They're less likely to be violent right away. Some other parts of Mexico, they could be more aggressive, a lot faster. Milton is a classic example of what journalists call a fixer. He was born and raised here. He's a reporter for a Mexican magazine. His other job is making life easier and safer for people like Yon Grillo and me. Here, he advises on what to do as we're being watched. In the sicarious time, they don't respect anything. What, what, what's, what's fascinating to me and, and, and alarming to me is that everybody here, every Mexican here understands what's happening when, when three big vehicles like this pull up next to the fence and everybody knows that all this is going on. You know, the, 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 the drug trafficking, the, the the, the, the jumping over the wall, uh, uh, the, the danger that exists from these dark forces, and they live with it every day. And, and it, it seems to be inescapable in some places of the country. Is well, I mean, that, is that a stretch? Yeah, I think, I think so, yeah. I mean, you've got a for, the force of an industry, the pull of money. So, you know, why are those guys a few meters from us right now? Why are they there? They're doing their job. Mm -hmm. Now, their job is trafficking drugs. But, this, yeah, our economic forces, these economic forces behind this. Sure. So the White, High, what, the White House carries out a survey every year or a report every year called what Americans spend on illegal drugs. Mm -hmm. And that report estimates that Americans spend $100 billion every year on marijuana, heroin, cocaine, cocaine. and crystal meth. So when you have $100 billion of money, 
and a, pro a product on this side of the fence is worth so much. And just by going onto this side of the fence, that product increases in value massively. Mm. I mean, think about kilo of cocaine. Mm. Okay, kilo of cocaine in Colombia, they buy it for about two thousand dollars. When they get it over on this side, it's worth about thirty thousand dollars for that kilo. So you're talking about for every dollar you invest, you get fifteen dollars back. You know, it's a better business than most people are in. So that's the force of money. So now we left there. Let's see what those guys are doing. They back out the trucks. They're still in the trucks. Yeah, I think you may want to keep the camera down when we go by. Further down this street, Yon explores this abandoned house, apparently used as a safe house by smugglers of drugs and human beings. So, uh, what is this, Yon? So this is a house which has been seized by the Federal Attorney General's Office of Mexico. Why? And uh, they seized this house and... Uh, uh, this was a house which was seized because there was a, a tunnel going from this house under the border into the United States. That's, that's the United States right there? That's the United States right there. So this is just uh, 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 a crossing, uh, an, an urban crossing. Grillo has written two highly acclaimed books on drug trafficking. Back in England, four of his friends died from drug use. So for him, this story is personal. And maybe that's why his work is so powerful. In this case, it seems to be cleaned out pretty well. He wasn't always a freelancer. He actually worked for a while for a global news service in Mexico. But he felt constrained. He wanted to cover the country his way. So he went back to freelancing. deported from the United States back to Mexico for reasons he didn't specify. This young man said he makes more in one day of labor in the United States than he does in one week in Mexico. That's his wife on the other side of the fence in the U.S. state of Arizona. We followed Grillo to a shelter for migrants, mostly from Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean. They were either on their way into the United States or were recently deported from the United States. Patrick Tombola is what many young freelancers aspire to be. A successful photo and video documentarian, he specializes in Latin America, the Middle East, and Europe. He's taken assignments from major newspapers and magazines around the world, sometimes at great personal risk. And then just all of a sudden, they just heard bam, 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 bam. And he, he got two, two of the back on his back that killed him. And then even after he was lying down, bleeding, the guard... We crisscrossed the city, gathering information. And with Milton's help, we interviewed the mayor of Nogales. Then we headed back to the hotel. Thank you. 
Megan Dollywall and Dominic Bracco embody the new breed of freelance foreign correspondent, perhaps more than any others I met on this trip to Mexico. They are bound together in part by their sense of independence and entrepreneurship. They are free spirits. She's worked as a Mexico City-based photojournalist for two years. He's been here for seven. Dominic found his place as a photojournalist in Mexico's northern city of Juarez, where the drug war raged and where thousands were killed. I've covered conflict on and off since 1979, and I've seen some hard things, but even I found some of his work tough to look at. I first met Dominic during his presentation at the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting in Washington, D.C. Megan used to work here, and Dominic has won grant money here. The Pulitzer Center is one of the nonprofits supporting freelancers overseas. Megan and Dominic personify the idealistic freelancers of today who have chosen lifestyles of purpose and meaning despite hardship and risk. This is a pretty tenuous, I mean, a lot of, a lot of people would think that being freelancers anywhere in the world is a tenuous, tenuous existence. I mean, you know, a lot of people just couldn't do this. They need, you know, a nine to five, they need a steady paycheck every month or every two weeks. Yeah. Um, how, how do you negotiate that? I mean, is that, is that an important consideration for you guys? So both of us grew up in households where our parents worked for themselves, which I think is interesting because uh, I never wanted to work for someone, really. I was raised with that mindset. I think Megan's the same way. Dominic was raised in South Texas, where his father owns a construction company. Megan's from New Jersey. Her mother is a commercial interior designer. It's difficult. You ha there's a lot of competition. There's a lot of great people. And you have to be better and smarter to survive. And so um, I think as hard as you'd have to work to maintain that, in my mind, you know, it's nice that you know like you're doing it for yourself every day. To make it in this career, you have to work your ass off, you know, and we, you know, we work really, really hard. How do you negotiate that, and, and you're separated? Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Often, sometimes, whatever, and so you have to go out alone. How, how, do, you, how do you, as a couple, how, how does that happen, how does it work? We've never known anything else. Like our whole relationship has been that. Our whole relationship, actually the coolest thing is like now we live together. So we get to come home to the same place, which we work really hard to make happy and safe and peaceful and have things that we both love in it. Um, and so I think we've just always been used to it. And I mean, you just sort of develop a way of communicating with each other. Would you say that that's right? Like when you're apart. That's the beautiful thing about dating a photographer is they understand when I'm like, can I talk right now? But I'm like, I'm fine and I'm safe and it's fine, but I can't talk to you right now. We're in the middle of something, but I love you and I'll talk to you tonight when I get back to the hotel. Yeah, I think we give each other the space to check out when we're gone. And then when you're here, you're kind of expected to be here. Kind of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It's a constant balance though. I mean, it's nothing yeah. perfect. Like we- It's not easy. No, it's not easy. Can you talk about that a little bit? What do you give up and what do you get in return? I think you give up some, you give up stability. I mean, being a freelancer, you have this really flexible life, but you also have this life that can change really fast. Um, and I think the word suck, like my family suffers is the wrong way to put that, but I think my family misses me, and I know I miss my family a lot. The, the instability kind of bothers you a bit, but not enough to stop doing this. Not work. enough to stop. And they're proud of me, and I'm really proud of myself, and I think it's worth it. My, and they're super supportive. Like, my 87-year-old my grandmother is like, you go, girl, you mm -hmm. know, so. It's a demanding job because you're, I mean, you, you have, there is no st stability, right? The only stability that her and I have is each other. What do you get in return for this instability? You get, um... The world? <laughs> no, you get total freedom. I mean, I have, I mean, at the same time, like, uh, I don't know, it depends on where you are in your career, right? So you go through different stages as a freelancer. There's, there's moments, you know, like any business where 
things are going really well and then that with that comes a certain amount of stability you know if you have a good base of savings then you have the ability to take control of your agenda you know and and that's why living cheaply is so important you know i think if you're if you're you know keeping your lower your overhead low then that gives you the ability to save cash for moments when you know you do want to spend time with your family or you do need to go on a vacation or you do get sick because that's the other thing is you get sick and you you know you you got to work you know when i saw this note on the refrigerator door something resonated deep inside me perhaps because i've been through this test of fire the challenges of living abroad away from family under constant stress it says i love you to the moon and back down to the bottom of the sea. I had the best month with you. I feel so lucky. Thank you for being the kind, generous soul you are. I know things are hard right now. I promise they will get better. I will be here to support you always. Have a great trip. See you on the 23rd. I love you. I don't know, you know, I was, I, of, of all the interviews that we've done, I think this one has moved me the most. And I think it's because it reminds me so much of, I, I recognize so much stuff there, you know, that, 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 that I have gone through when I first came here. Um, you know, the excitement of all the possibilities in the future. Um, um, I guess the, 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 the tenuous nature of, of what so many freelancers are doing. Um, and, 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 you know, the hope that, that they, you know, that, that Dominic and Megan inspire, you know? And you just, you just wish that everything turns out right for them. Friday afternoon traffic. Oh. Oh, that was close. And that's how David Agron's story began. He's a freelance foreign correspondent who sells his work mostly to USA Today, The Washington Post, and The Guardian. So, so where are we now? We're in uh, Tultepec, or at least on the road to Tultepec, which is a city uh, to the north of, of uh, Mexico City, and it's known for fireworks. People here uh, make fireworks, sell fireworks. People come here to buy fireworks. And every so often the town goes boom. Uh, today is the end of the National uh, Pyrotechnics Fair. So we're going to witness the last, the last day, which should include uh, what they call musical fireworks. So tonight what they're going to do is they're, they figure, because the big industry in town is fireworks, and these people are not going to stop making fireworks or selling fireworks, they figure the best way to honor the, uh, the dead is with, well, more fireworks by shooting off 50, you know, 50 kilograms of fireworks. So it's gonna, it's, it should be a show. The explosions and fire killed and wounded dozens of people. So three months after the tragedy, I accompanied David to follow up on the story. So you're doing this story yeah. about this town where just a few months ago, yeah. the, the fireworks exploded and killed how many people? Uh, 42. Okay, but what, what for, for your readers, which is why I was asking yeah. you who your readers are, right. why is this important to them? What does it say? What are you, what are you getting at here, oh. aside from you know, the aftermath of the tragedy? Well, it just seems like uh, after the events, uh, everyone's sort of sad for a little, but then just life goes on. There's something very interesting about, the, the, about Mexico in that sense. So I think I'm capturing that sense of, the, of, of Mexican, I would, say, I would say in some ways resilience, in some ways stubbornness. 
Uh, that's that's and, the story. Yeah, isn't but, it? but also, but I mean, that's sort of the positive. That's that's the positive way to describe it. I don't know if the, the, the from the more negative, you would also say that this is this is an activity that perhaps uh, has been carried on a little too loosey goosey for too long. This is pretty incredible. I mean, this is a big goddamn operation. That's been yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's bigger than I thought. Spook house. As David and I toured this kaleidoscope of Mexico, I had to think hard about the lack of regulation and the acceptance of these deaths as just another fact of life. But I was reminded once again of the wonder of our craft, our ticket to participate in the global conversation. It's the thrill and the gratification of this experience that has kept me active in the field for so long. And here's one of the downsides of journalism. You eat what you can, when and where you can. Here, it's churros, fried bread dough smothered in sugar. Born in Canada, David first visited Mexico as an exchange student. He returned years later to take a job as a reporter. The big thing is just find reactions to, uh, to the fact that this market blew up, that this town suffered a horrible tragedy, and they're, what they're going, the way they're going to respond to that tragedy is to ignite more fireworks. He's an observer of the human condition and goes about his work much like an anthropologist. I just want to know what people are thinking. What's, wh why, why this? Would they ever have considered changing things, uh, changing their practices, yeah. abandoning the business? Uh, that's what I'd like to know. After years of freelancing in Mexico, David says returning to Canada would be boring. You can see why. What's the story behind this? This this is one of those ones, you know, I was telling you about when you see it mm -hmm. and you just go for it. Yeah. And I didn't think twice this guy was, this is in Garibaldi, the Garibaldi Square, the, yeah. Where the mariachis hang out. Yeah. I got close to him and there's that balance that you want to get the photo, but at the same time, not necessarily intrude. There's something going on there that, that speaks to, you know, how people relate to the environment, how they deal with elements, how they deal with things that they have in with their light. hands, all that. At the end of the day, he's probably happy you made the photograph. Uh, I, would, I would like to think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, It's one of the things that keeps us doing what we yeah, do, isn't it? exactly. So. You have to feel some sense of a mission <clears throat> that what we're doing is important. Keith Dannemiller is emblematic of the change affecting freelancers. He's lived in Mexico since 1987. Once covering breaking news for major newspapers and magazines, Keith now makes his living largely by shooting for nonprofits, documenting street life in Mexico City, and conducting photo workshops and guided tours. When you first came here, I mean, the situation, the journalism situation was very, very different, I think. Um, at least that's, that's part of the, the, the premise of this whole, this whole endeavor of, of mine about freelancers. You came down as a freelancer. I came to the region as a freelancer. There were dozens, if not scores, of journalists here from different countries. Um, once the, the conflict began in Central America, there were hundreds of journalists, many of them freelancers, and, and you know, real bureaus all through the region. Can you talk about the, 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 the difference between then and now, what that all looks like now? The difference between then and now? I mean, I don't know. I, I, I couldn't count 
uh, how many different newspapers and magazines, but it was, you know, sort of uh, obviously the big magazines, the big newspapers, second level, third level, you know, newspapers that had offices here. Yeah. So there were a lot of people to make contact with. There was a lot of possibilities here to do freelance work at that point. Today, hoy en día, forget it. So that situation vis-a-vis -vis correspondence and fixed offices and relationship to the home office has changed drastically. How do people get news now out of, out of Mexico? Where does, it, where does it come from? There are possibilities, and yes, obviously the New York Times, the Washington Post still need photos, and there are people that can do things, but the sheer number of possible points of contact and work has dropped drastically. You don't really do a lot of like kind of the news assignments anymore. No, 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 no. Can you talk about what you do not what you do now? I mean you're still a photographer. I'm still a photographer. That continues to today, 30 years later. I'm still photographing here on the streets in the center of Mexico City. I've had exhibitions over the years. It's a documentary project. I mean it's it's you know I'm still that's what I learned, that's how I photograph, that's how I still photograph. I look at it as documenting a certain space and time yeah. here in Mexico City. I mean, I still have, you know, a, uh, an assignment here, an assignment there. I still pitch things, you know, to try and interest people in stories. A lot of times it has to do with Guerrero. A lot of times it has to do with violence. A lot of times it has to do with displaced people. But the response, you know, once again, being honest, the response to those kind of stories is just not what it used to be. Just months after this conversation, a powerful earthquake rocked Mexico City, killing hundreds. And the response was overwhelming. For weeks following the quake, Keith was swamped with assignments documenting the tremors aftermath. Neither Keith nor any member of his immediate family was injured during the earthquake. But his apartment building was badly damaged. He and his wife refused to return, believing the building to be unsafe. Another of my colleagues was not so lucky. I knew Wesley Boxy back in the 1980s when we both covered the conflicts raging across Central America. Like me, he once was a freelance photojournalist. Wesley was badly injured in the quake. His wife was killed. This is a compromise that all foreign correspondents, not just freelancers, live with every day. In their quest for truth, they face unforeseen circumstances of living in countries that pose risks that we seldom have to consider. It's my last day in Nogales with Yon Grillo. We sit down to discuss what he's learned here before heading out one more time to the border separating Mexico from the United States. What are the most important takeaways from this, from this really widely spread um, reporting trip um, that we've witnessed you execute over the past couple of days? Over the last few days of reporting, I've learned some things about the human smuggling and drug smuggling networks into the United States. Uh, I've been reporting on this border for 15 years, and I've seen some changes now than before. Uh, before, you had some people would go over the border by themselves, and some people would go with human smugglers known as coyotes or polleros. Now, from this reporting, people are saying that you cannot cross the border without paying a coyote. It, people say now if you try and go near the wall, the desert, any place right now and you haven't paid, people are gonna beat the head out of you or kill you for not paying for their services. So they really now have, have tightened that up. And all of these coyotes 
now there used to be some coyotes who were like independent kind of workers gradually the cartels got more and more involved and now all of them are working for the cartels so any migrant has to pay a coyote any coyote has to pay a cartel and the money the cost that the coyotes are charging has increased a lot a few years ago i was up here reporting and it was like two thousand dollars that people would pay a coyote to go to the united states now it's four and a half thousand dollars it seems to me that this is a profound dramatic change in how things operate um, on the border not just in terms of 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 of, of how the, the the cartels work in this region but also in a sense that it represents to me a, 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 a greater vacuum of power exerted by the, 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 the state. Am I wrong about this or is that, does that sound correct? This is part of a, a wider problem in Mexico of the cartels taking over so many aspects of life in Mexico. They're not just drug traffickers. These are criminal organizations uh, moving into a whole bunch of realms. So here, the human smuggling industry, the migrant industry, is now controlled by cartels. Uh, but also, they control political power in many local levels. So that you see cities and towns in Mexico where the mayors have to pay 10% of their budget to the cartel. Not the other way around. You know, it used to be that the cartels, would, the drug traffickers would bribe the mayors. Now the mayors have to pay the cartels. You see uh, areas of mining that have been taken over by cartels. The cartels were involved in the theft of petroleum, of crude oil. We're talking about billions of dollars here. So they're now like these criminal warlord type figures controlling these aspects. As Yon and Milton plan a trip back to the border, I consider the sum of what I've seen here. Violence, failing health care, powerful cartels, corruption, all signs of a crippled, dysfunctional state. Where we're going right now is the east. We're following a uh, uh, local police vehicle there. Uh, Milton uh, called some contacts in the local police saying we're interested in going out there and can they uh, come with us. It's a security precaution because it's a rough area, as Milton says, it's uh, uh, Territorio Apache, <laughs> which is a, a phrase they use in, in, in Spanish to talk about uh, tough areas. beautiful place and sadly such a potentially violent place there's the US border fence atop a hillside it looks like a giant spinal column of rusted steel separating the two countries this is a flood zone during rainy season the border is actually railroad tracks and barbed wire, as opposed to a solid wall or fence that would hinder the flow of water and debris across the landscape. So uh, I was just talking to Comandante Mendoza, and, and he was uh, describing how this area is normally patrolled by the military and the federal police, not the city police. This is normally the military and federal police uh, patrolling this area looking after this area uh, because, you know, this is their jurisdiction because they can, if they do run into stuff, it can often be quite heavily armed guys. You can see these kind of things um, are pretty attractive to, to smugglers, these kind of places. I mean, that's the United States right there. Yeah. And there's Mexico right here. And that looks pretty easy to jump. I mean, we could very easily sure. go to the United States. Thousands of undocumented migrants cross this border each year. They flee poverty and drug gangs in their own countries. 
Most bring only clothes on their back and hope in their heart for new life in the United States. We've been here a little over 24 hours. Yeah. And in that time frame, you have gone out at night to look at the fence, to look around Nogales. You have interviewed the mayor of this city. We have come out here to the countryside. We've done a couple of other things, you know, running around and working, you know, pretty much 24 hours a day. Mm. Um, do you think that people understand what real journalists do? What's your perception of what they perceive? What I want them to understand from this particular, I'm thinking about the story itself. So, I mean, like all of these stories are complicated um, and, and I, I want to show different sides. So this is not just simple. I mean, there is an issue with you know, the United States uh, border with undocumented workers, with cartels, with smugglers. These are real issues. Uh, but what I want to try and get across a lot of this is the real human stories. So when you go to these uh, shelters and you see people who are human beings who have had tough lives and lived tough lives, you know, and you imagine what they go through. You know, people just coming out of incarceration, uh, being deported and, and, and trying to send money back to their family to feed their children. Mm. These are the human stories mm. uh, that whatever you feel about these issues, and they're real issues, they're real issues with, uh, um, with undocumented workers in the workforce, with wages, with trade unions, with social services, with hospitals. These are, these are real issues for people. But people need to feel the humanity of these stories, you know, uh, the humanity of these people um, in this. You know, I try and do these things from my heart and, and do good work. Regardless of how we feel about the legality or the humanity of it all, this long steel line separates more than just two nations. It separates husbands from wives, children from parents, brothers from sisters. As Yon, Grillo, and I walk along this frontier, I wonder if it's not these freelancers who help send us the truth about Mexico and the rest of the world, then who?